it's the same thing. It's the same root when you go back to the beginning. Penal, obviously, still basically means the same thing today. It's related to or pertaining to punishment under law. And so, what we find is that in English, as it pulled in the notion of the legal penitence, the sorrow for the legal consequences, like the, the, the infusion of the Latin and the English, basically resulted in what we have today where there's kind of a conflation of repenting, meaning feel sorry and you know, change your mind, but you're sorry for what you did and you're sorry for facing the consequences. I think when we use repent today, it's definitely in that sphere. It's in, the, it's in that lexical scope that we're using the word. And when we look at another word that's related, the word contrition is specifically an emotional word. Contrition is also about 700 years old in English. It means brokenness of spirit for having given offense, deep sorrow for sin or guilt with the purpose of not sinning again. So, in the order of service, when the general confession of sins is given, you'll find something similar in Lutheran churches and some others, where we say, I am heartily sorry for my sins and I sincerely repent of them. And the reason that those things are right next to each other is they're closely related. But if you listen carefully and you pay attention to all the words that are present, as I beg people regularly online to do, Heartily sorry for them means contrition, means I am contrite, and sincerely repent of them obviously means something different than I'm heartily sorry for them, because the sorry is already covered. And so, in the general confession, we say I'm heartily sorry for my sins and I sincerely repent of them. The and there is because we're saying two different things. And I think this is where our understanding of repent in English has kind of gone off the rails, because like I said, when we say repent, we usually think, I feel sorry. An example I've given in a past episode was when the former chief executive of CNN got caught for decades of abuse of girls under his supervision. He put out a very tearful press release, and he was very sorry for getting caught. He was sorry for being embarrassed in public. A Christian who was naively looking at that thing would think, oh, he repented. What happens in cases like that where we have these public confessions of sin in grieving and tears? Jimmy Swaggart saying, I have sinned, and he's tears streaming down his face. That is not repentance. That may be contrition, but frankly, in most cases, when someone is called out publicly, what's often happening is they're sorry they got caught, they're sorry that they're facing consequences. They may, in fact, even be sorry that they did whatever wicked thing that they did, but the question of repentance is a separate question from those things, because repentance doesn't mean I feel bad about it. It means I've changed my mind about it. So, in Greek, the verb for repent, to say to repent, is metanoeo, and the underlying definition of that is properly to think differently afterwards. It's talking about a change of mind. It's talking about an intellectual switch being flipped, where you thought one thing, and then you thought a different thing. And so, when you look at the Greek conception of what we translate as repent, what you don't find is contrition. You don't find any sorrow. You don't necessarily even specifically find anything about sin. Now, in Scripture, it's always talking about repenting in the context of sin, but this is why it's so crucial, because what repentance means in the Bible is to think differently afterwards about your sin. So, in the case of some e-celeb or some real celebrity, some executive who publicly confesses a sin tearfully, in order to determine whether or not they have repented, they would have to think differently afterwards about whatever it was that they were confessing. So, when the guy puts out a press release and says, oh, I'm so sorry that for decades I was abusing these girls under my authority, is he actually saying, I don't want to do that anymore, that was evil, I never should have done it? Or is he just saying, I'm sorry I got caught? The reality is he's saying, I'm sorry I got caught. So, even if it's contrition, it is not repentance, because it's, repentance is a repudiation 
of one's past sins. It's looking at what you did in the past and saying, this is no longer me. This is disgusting. I hate what I was doing. And the reason that's crucial is that it is, it's separate from feeling bad about your sin. For those in our audience who are Roman Catholic, you're going to notice a difference between what Lutherans and Roman Catholics believe when it comes to this issue. And it is worth highlighting that. Many, and in fact most, Protestants are going to agree with what the Lutherans believe on this particular subject. And so, historically and still today, the Roman Catholics conceive of repentance, which they would call the sacrament of penance or reconciliation, or confession even, they conceive of it as having three parts, or a fourth part. The fourth part is implied for those who say it has only three, although most modern interpreters, I believe, will say that there are four distinct parts. And those would be contrition, confession, satisfaction, and then absolution, which follows those things. The problem with this conception of repentance is that it turns it into works righteousness. This is what actually would make it works righteousness. We know that there are going to be some listeners who are going to think that what we are saying is works righteousness, but that is not what we're saying, because what we are saying is that this is the and then what of the Christian life. That is so often the focus of Stone Choir episodes. We got justification right in the Reformation. That's done. It's settled. We're not fighting over that anymore. Yes, if we're rehashing those debates in some cases, we're fighting over justification again. So, for instance, we still disagree with Rome when it comes to justification. But with other Protestants, there's no real argument there. That's not the problem. We're talking about what do you do as a Christian once you are converted? What is the Christian life? And the Christian life very well is repentance. And so the Lutheran and the Protestant conception of repentance is contrition and faith. Now, we have to be careful about that faith part, because the faith part is more encompassing than what most are going to believe when they just hear faith. Okay, faith. I, I have faith, so I have therefore repented. Faith in this context means the entirety of the Christian life going forward. Read James, basically. Because the real Christian, the actual Christian, the Christian who has a living faith, is going to do certain things and not do certain things because of that faith. That is what repentance is. Repentance is that change of mind, that metanoia, to use the Greek term, that accompanies an actual living faith. It is to turn away from your sin because you now recognize it as sin. You recognize it as abhorrent. If you don't have a real faith, if you're just standing up and apologizing because you were caught, which, as Woe said, is often the case, and it very much is often the case in the public realm, particularly the political realm. Contrary to that sort of false repentance, real repentance is to look at the things that you once did and find them disgusting, because you now think about them differently from how you thought about them before you were regenerated. That is sanctification. That is the Christian life. That is how these things are supposed to work. There's a little bit of irony here, perhaps, with the modern practice in the political realm when it comes to so-called repentance, because historically, in the churches, in the early churches, one of the things that they would do with regard to repentance was have someone who had committed some sort of transgression stand up, be accused of that before the congregation, and then publicly repent. Now that led to some various problems, and so there's some reasons those things changed historically. And obviously you can recognize there's a bit of a perverse incentive there perhaps to be falsely repentant because you were accused publicly. And that's what we see happening in the political realm. For the Christian, repentance is a real change of mind. Again, it is to look at the things that you once did and to find them abhorrent, 
because you have been given a new mind. You have been regenerated. You have been given the Spirit, and therefore you find sin to be repulsive. You turn away from it, which is what this is. This is a turning away from sin. It is a change in your life. It is a real and tangible thing. And there may be some who will be thinking, well, isn't that judging someone if we decide if his faith is real based on? And the answer is yes. And we did an entire episode on judgment because of this. It is entirely licit. It is, in fact, commanded that we judge others on this sort of basis. Because you can tell if someone has had a real change in his life. You can tell if he has a living faith by what he does. If someone says, I repent of X, and then he gets caught doing X again and again and again, you very well know that that repentance was probably false. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a particular sin that plagues you, you are impenitent because you fall back into that sin. That just means that the ongoing process of sanctification is in fact an ongoing process. We are all going to have certain sins that are more difficult to clean out, more difficult to eject from our lives. And we can all think of what our personal sin is in this case. Repentance in those cases is going to mean looking at that with disgust, looking at it with abhorrence, recognizing that it is sin, and wanting to turn away from it. And you can find comfort, of course, in the words of Paul. You know, the very thing that you want to do is the thing you do not do. The very thing that you do not want to do is the thing that you do. That is part of having original sin. It is part of living in a fallen world. But repentance is that change of mind and that desire to do differently and working toward it. Because the Christian life is not just one of going, oh, I wish things were better. No. You work toward making things better. There are works in the Christian life. We're saved by works, Christ's works. We're not saved by our works. However, once we have been regenerated and given a living faith, that faith will necessarily result in works, a change in behavior, a change in mindset, which is what we are looking at when it comes to repentance, because repentance, again, is the Christian life. I think one of the real problems that we all have when we're trying to wrap our heads around all these things that are related to sin and sorrow for sin, asking for forgiveness, receiving forgiveness, repenting of those sins, I think the difficulty that we all have intellectually as we're just trying to wrap our heads around it is that we necessarily want to look of all, all those things on a timeline where you have A and then B and then C and then D where there's a causal chain, where A affects B and B affects C, where you sinned and therefore you're sorry because you know the law, you know God's law, and then you receive the gospel, you hear the gospel, and you receive forgiveness. And when the problem is that when we try to pinpoint, okay, well, am I forgiven yet? Am I forgiven now? Is that it doesn't approach the question the way God does. Because time is part of creation. Time is not something that limits God. God created time in order to order things. I can't even say the sentence without using order twice, because that's, <laughs> that's the nature of how God has structured everything. And so, I think the same problem that we face today when we're trying to figure out, well, if, if I'm sorry and then I'm forgiven, but then I have to repent, and if I don't repent, I'm not forgiven. It seems like we're putting causality into the mix. And so, one of the things we want to highlight here is that that's not the case. When you think about Christ's satisfaction for your sins on the cross, this happened in the past. It happened 2,000 years ago. It's a concrete thing in time. For us, it's in the past. For men like Abraham, they were looking thousands of years into the future for that event to occur. The same benefit that accrues to us from the cross accrued to those men who received it by faith before it happened. How? Because God operates outside of time. When Christ said, it is finished on the cross, he was paying for every sin and every direction on the timeline. And this is actually one of the problems in the early church. There was a heresy that sprung up that said that 
anyone who wasn't alive and heard the gospel, and, and anyone who died before Jesus died couldn't be forgiven because they didn't know about it. That's because they were trying to look at causality being connected to time, and that's simply not how God works. Our names were written in the book of life from before eternity.